But we know not where we should pray as we ought. But it is the Spirit that make it intercession. With groanings. Lord, let your people come together in one place and on one accord. For your word declares, if a man speak it in an unknown tongue, Hallelujah. Oh, Let me speak the mysteries of God. In the spirit we pray. Hallelujah. We utter great mysteries. Oh God, now we thank you. Oh God, now we praise you. Oh God, now we lift you up. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Let your sound. Oh, say, permeate this place like no other. Let the glory be revealed. Let the power be revealed. Let the anointing be revealed. In the name of Jesus, oh God. When you say in your word, Yeah. 
leading me. And then I said to him, Lord, what do you want me to say? And he said, sometimes we have too many words. Sometimes we just need to let the Holy Spirit make intercession for us. The word of God says, when the, the Spirit makes intercession for you, it's with moanings and groanings that cannot be uttered. Don't look at the person. 
you're so stuck on, well, my mama didn't do it that way, and my daddy didn't do it that way, and this church taught me this way, and this church taught me that way, you are operating in disobedience. We have to crucify ourselves. You know, the Lord has been, don't don't get don't get scared by how many notes I was typing in the, the font was small, so it printed out really big. But I've been sitting on this word for almost a month. And it's just like it's so overwhelming because as a prophet of God, you have to get the people in alignment with his instructions and who he is. And oftentimes it doesn't feel right. Oftentimes it doesn't even come to me and things that are fluffy for me to, to give to you. So that means I've endured something to even release this word. I, and sometimes we're still in the process of enduring as these words are coming forth, but I know in my spirit that this is not just for me, but it's for the body, the remnant, the people who are not in delusion, the people who are steadfast, unmovable, abounding in the works of the Lord, people who don't mind crucifying their flesh, people who don't mind denying themselves. That's what and who this word is for. And I know we're on the sermon series of bolder, stronger, wiser. And so even in this, I want you to understand that this will make you bolder, stronger, wiser. But it may hit your spirit just a little different. I'm trying to prepare your flesh for this as well as your spirit. Because sometimes when we hear things that are not fluffy to our ears, we have to get out of hearing things that tickle our ears, that doesn't profit our spirit. I even tell my kids what the Bible says. You can, don't, don't be in fear of, of what man can do to you, but be fear of God. Have a reverential fear of God, one who can put your soul into hell. Listen, I don't care who don't like it, what they have to say about it, how they feel about it. This is the word of the Lord, and it will equip you to move forward in Christ. I titled this sermon, I Violated the Family Code. I Violated the Family Code. And a month ago, Apostle Reggie and myself were driving home, and we always had these thought-provoking conversations about what's going on, what's going on in our own families, what's going on in life, what's going on in whatever and what have you. And out of my mouth, I said, Tatiana, well, what did I do to them? Why do they hate me so much? I didn't do anything to them. And I heard, you violated the family code. And I said, my God. And so let me explain to you what violate means. It means to break. Follow me in the spirit. Amen. It means to break or fail to comply with a rule or formal agreement. Let me say it again. The word violate means to break or fail to comply with a rule or formal agreement. And the Lord had given me this scripture I'll give to you, but I'm going to be talking about Joseph and how he violated the family code. 1 Corinthians 15 and 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, in the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. Knowing that in the Lord, say it with me, in the Lord, in the Lord, your labor is not in vain, because oftentimes we do things out of our own labor. We do things out of our family labor. We do things out of traditional labor. And all those things end up in vain. But knowing that, the, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. So when we do our works, they must be in the Lord. The Bible says, how do you, do you, do you build a house? How do you build a house? You count up the cost. 
You count up the labor, you count up the cost before. You don't go and say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build this magnificent uh, mansion, a state, right? And I don't understand how I have to hire an architect. The architect has to get out the blueprints. The blueprints have to, we have to get a general contractor. General contractor better, better be licensed. And then he has to get a staff of people who are equipped and competent to build the house based, based on my specifications. How much is the material going to cost? The nuts, the bolts, the, the, the paint on the wall, the stuff or the brick. You have to count up the cost. Now, if you're willing to count up the cost on your own accord, then your own accord will keep it up. If you do your labor based on what God is calling you to do, then he will keep it up. But I don't want to put my hands to anybody's plow that I thought was good. Again, I cannot be a delusional believer to think because God is with me, then whatever I do, he'll be with me. Listen, he's not obligated to do anything you have ordained yourself to do and then stamp his name on it and think he's going to perform it. We have to tear down, build up, and what, what, what has gone on and for generations now is that people will, will, will come up to this pulpit or behind the sacred desk, whatever you want to call it, the stage, whatever, and they give you sermons, they give you teachings that tickle your flesh or tickle your ears, that, that, that coddles you, but it does not equip you for the working of the kingdom of God. don't need the amens, but God needs your agreement. My God. And so being steadfast means be firm and secure. So if you're steadfast, you're firm and you're secure in what God has called you to do. This is why we my, it, I violate the family code say with that, but we cannot be too delusional to think that we can come up with things of our own and be firm and secure in that and God perform it, he won't do it. Listen, I wrote a whole book called Cry Baby Faith, and Cry Baby Faith talks about how I came into agreement with what I wanted to do. I was holding on to it. I was firm and secure in my own thoughts, in my own ways, and I said, Lord, well, you're with me. I'm your child. I have favor with you. Now you perform it. And he didn't say no audibly. He didn't give me an unction no. He let me sit in that until I was mature enough to say, get your tail off that couch, quit crying, that's not me. What the enemy wanted me to do was be comfortable in believing something myself and then thinking God told me to do it so when I got to the point where it should happen, then I would be disappointed in God. That happened for years. That happened for years. So that's why we cannot be disillusioned. We have to be sober-minded. We have to be vigilant. We have to know the word of God. If it's not in here and he didn't give you revelation on it, we shouldn't be doing it. And we also shouldn't be taking this and giving our own interpretation of it and then making people do it and making it as law. That, listen, that's how denominations got started. And God told us in the word of God that you don't worship this way. I teach you how to worship. And so what has happened was people said, well, no, I want to worship like this. So they go over here and they start their own clique. And then these people said, well, I don't want to worship like him. So I'll go over here and I start my way in worshiping like this. But the Bible says this. He's looking for true worshipers, those who worship him in spirit and in truth. The true word of God in context how he is giving it to us in his interpretation. That is not my sermon, but you know what I'm saying today. We have to understand, we have to know who God is so we don't get caught up. Oh my God, we don't get caught up in the disillusion of churches and ministries and teachings and teachings of people that just want to manipulate you to serve them. Everything I should preach and teach should point you back to God and point you to the scriptures and for us to be like the Bereans and seek after it ourselves to see what God is saying for us. I may get up here and give you a sermon, but then God gets home and you're in your Bible and you're digging and he gives you a deeper understanding of what it is. But we are in a microwavable uh, generation where we feel like everything should just be given to us. But that's what has happened to the generations prior to us. They went to church. They heard the pastor. They didn't believe the scriptures. They didn't even research the scriptures. Half of them couldn't even read. But the pastors wasn't even living right. So everything that poured out of them 
it was perverted. And so now you have a generation of perverted people who's passing the generation on to perverted wow. people. And then we're here saying, no, this ain't right. Y'all been doing it right. And then they're like, but we've been doing this for 50 years. I care not. That's right. That's right. I care not. We are not supposed to be stuck in yesteryear. We are supposed to be going, moving forward, singing, hearing, declaring, praying what the heavenlies are saying. Not what we sung and dealt with and sailed with in years of slavery and oppression. How does that bring us out? My God is I immovable, not able to be moved. So we have to be flat-footed. I'm extremely flat-footed. That's why I take my shoes off half the time. We can, you can't move me out of the way. You can, you can try to. You can talk about me. Y'all can get together and, and do whatever you need to do and have clicks and say, well, she didn't do this, she didn't do that. Listen, what? y'all know my life is very transparent. So when I, I formally graduated with my doctorate, we heard all kinds of crazy stuff. Well, technically, I had finished college in August of the prior year. They were just waiting for my graduation. And had you remembered that I told you last year, you wouldn't have had these meetings to talk about me, but I had to be immovable. I had to be immovable because I'm going to get you to where Joseph is. You'll understand why I'm saying this in just a minute. But abounding. Abounding means existing in or providing a great or plentiful quantity or supply. If we're abounding in the work of the Lord, if we are existing in it. And so I know we have heard, and I know you've probably heard this before, that we are purpose driven to death. Purpose driven church, purpose driven life, purpose driven this. You can do what you want to do. You live only once. You do what's the, what you're most passionate about. But all of that means nothing if we're not abounding in the work of the Lord. We are not ourselves. We are supposed to deny ourselves. Pick up your cross and follow me. But how do we come up and say, oh, I feel like I need to open up an ice cream shop because that sounds good. And so that's God. No, our purpose and destiny is only in God. It's not within ourselves. I don't care how many degrees I have, how many alphabets I have after my name. My only purpose is in Christ. And whatever that looks like, it has to be in him. I can't come up with things that I want to do, no matter how much student loans I have. <laughs> I, my work has to be abounding in him. Because it will be in vain. Who want to live 40 years of doing something that God said, well, that's not what I called you to do. Right? My God, that is wasteful. I want you guys to keep that, that scripture in the forefront of your mind because when you get to a certain a position like Joseph did, you will remember to be steadfast. You will remember to be immovable. You will remember to always abound in the work of God. Get out of your thinking I'm my own. I have my own purpose, my own destiny. No, your identity is in Christ. Your destiny is in Christ. Your purpose is in Christ. And that's where we go when we get to Joseph. So Joseph, everybody kind of knows the story. And if you don't, I'm, just, I'm not going to read it. But it starts at Genesis 37. And, and oftentimes we focus, which we should, on what God has called us to do. But we lack in the wise counsel around us telling us you don't need to tell everybody. Listen, it burns me when I see men and women of God on social media telling people their next plans. People are excited. I get it. There's, there are some good people on social media. I get it. But did God release you to say what his instructions are online? Or did you release it to fulfill that demonic system that you're still holding on to? That need for attention. How rejection has beat you down so much so you feel like you gotta tell everybody so you can get a thousand likes. Listen, what 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 did you say the scripture this morning? About the few, the few. I would rather have the few in God. You have to understand that when God has given us an assignment, we're not told about all the things that will happen to us along the way. So that's why you have to be immovable. That's why you have to be steadfast. That's why you have to have a close relationship with God and understand his character. You have to know that. And I'm here to share that because you decided to go with God and violate the family code. And that means being stuck. 
being disobedient, being demonically driven, sin or whatever, that it's been a hit out on your life. It's been a hit out on your life, but this is a challenge to you to make you bolder, stronger, wiser. A challenge to you to, to hold closely to what God has given you. So in chapter 37 of Genesis, we talk about, he talks about Joseph. And I'm going to read just a little bit, a few things, but I want you to just, just walk this journey with me in understanding of, of the importance of removing yourself from people, places, things traditions, family members, ways of doing things, jobs, whatever takes precedent over the instructions God has given you, the importance of doing it, the importance of doing it, because um, now it's real witchy for people to say, you know, you can't talk to your family, you don't talk to your family because it's a way to hold you, to keep you manipulative, right? I'm talking about when it interrupts or comes in the path of what God is calling you to do to bring them out. I'm trying not to go there. It's a little bit later, but I'm trying. That's the whole purpose. So Joseph, he had these dreams. They were all, listen, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. They were in the land of Canaan. And, and everybody knows Jacob had all these sons, right? Joseph was the baby at the time. And he's walking around telling them, I had these dreams. You know, that the, the stars will come down, the moon and stars will come down. This is in 37. You can read it. But then his brothers was like, wait a minute, hold up. We gonna bow down to you? And so at that moment, hatred took over. Hatred took over because they didn't understand. If they had understood that Joseph is the forerunner of the family, they would have ushered him in a better way. Oh, yes, we will. The Lord is kind. The Lord is. But what happens is our flesh, our wounds, our childhood traumas, our experiences, all those things hijacks us and so we like but hold up I, no we, I ain't doing that but sometimes we have to have a holy hush because you can mess up the plan of God for your life by speaking against who's supposed to go before you yeah. and without saying without reading reading verse to verse even Jacob I serve the God the God of Abraham the God of Isaac the God of Jacob we say that and then even Jacob said, wait a minute, me and your mama going to buy that on you? He said it twice. Yep. But then it says, in my version, but his father kept saying it in, his, in the mind, in his mind. And so in, in another version it says, he took note of the matter. So meaning, since we are all believers of Jesus Christ, and we're all made in his image, there's something inside of you that always pulls to the right place. Side, even though we be like, mm -mm, I don't want to do that. I go this way. There's something in you that always knows this is the right thing. And so even for Jacob, he took note of the matter. Let me not speak on this. Let me use some wisdom. I don't know what's coming ahead. He may know something that I don't know. And as I'm talking to you today, I want you to look at yourselves as the Josephs in your family in your circle, in your job, in your organizations, in your ministry, because there's work for you to do, but we can get caught up in the opinions. We can get caught up in the ways of it. Can you imagine if Joseph was pleading with his brothers? Can y'all just listen? Can y'all just believe me? Can you imagine if he took his time, if he wasted his time going back and forth with them to get them to believe? Where in the Bible did it tell us to plead with the people to believe what God is telling them to do? Now, I don't know because it doesn't say if God didn't tell Joseph to say it one no way or the other, but I believe in my spirit that it was, it was foresight. It, it needed to happen to get him from one place to the other. So Genesis 37 and 12 says, Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel, which is Jacob, said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pastoring the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. 
So he said to him, go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, what are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers. Now this is what the Lord had gave me. He gave me revelation on this part. He said, Jacob has sent Joseph to his brothers. When he got there, he didn't see them. So there was another voice said there in Dotham. And so along our journeys, he had already told his brothers, he had already told his father, I'm, I'm, you're going to bow before me and all of that. And, but he's doing everyday things, things that he's supposed to do as normal. And so you're working as normal. You're, you're going to the mall as normal. You're going to the grocery store as normal. And then along the way, there's a voice of wisdom saying, no, they didn't go here, but they went here. How many of us would have rejected the voice of wisdom along the journey? Because they're not my friend. They're not my favorite prophet, prophet on Facebook. <laughs> they're not my favorite apostle. I don't like that denomination. And so it's very important that you are so tuned to God's voice. A sheep knows their shepherd's voice, right? And they don't listen to anything else. And so when the voice of God is speaking through somebody else with wisdom, did you take heed to it? And Joseph did. And so it almost makes me feel like Joseph was in the field kind of wandering and around and the man of wisdom was saying, what is this kid doing? You know what I mean? Because along the way, we don't know what we're doing a lot of the times. And so the Lord sends people there to help us along the way. And so you have to get to a place where you're listening to the voice of wisdom. 16 says, I am seeking my brothers. He said, tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? And the man said, they have gone away. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. Now, Dothan is very important. And so it says, so Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Dothan means two wells. Y'all know where Joseph was thrown in. It means two wells. And there's only two places in the Bible that Dothan comes up in. It's Elisha. He said he was being hunted by king of Aram. And he said, blind the eyes of my enemies. And Elisha's home was Dothan. So can you put those two together? Two wells. And Joseph was going there for his brothers to do, y'all know, all kind of crazy things with him. And then even Elisha was there saying, Lord, blind the eyes of my enemies. I want y'all to see how our lives are intricately detailed. You know, line upon line, precept on precept, along the way. We may not completely understand the instruction in that direction, but we have to lead with the voice of God. And so verse 18 says, they saw him from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said one to another, here comes this dreamer. <laughs> Prophetess uh, Sophia Ruffin at the conference said, y'all don't just me. <laughs> like she just a prophet, she just this. Don't just me, I'm not just a dreamer. Listen, this dreamer is here to preserve your life. Put some respect on my name. Put some respect on my name. I'm just saying, put some respect on him. But they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. Okay. I want y'all to understand how important. See, this is the thing. Joseph was on a journey to violate the code. He was on a journey to violate the family code because they were all shepherds. They were all in the fields, pasturing. Can you imagine being a shepherd? Can you imagine being, let's take it slave, because some of y'all are not farmers. Y'all are not from the country. So that's the even slave mentality, right? Can you imagine another slave? Y'all slaving together, y'all picking the cotton. Somebody come to you and say, I'm about to be your master. Right, and so it's it's that kind of angst, it's that kind that hatred, that kind of hatred kills. Right, you don't you don't even have the 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 mindset of thinking that what what is he saying? What, what, how can I benefit from this? But but you have to you have to understand that people want you to stay in the same maybe miserable life they are or the same traditions they've been taught 
the same ways they've been taught, maybe because they don't have the wherewithal to get out, they don't have the strength to get out, they don't have the discipline to get out, but God is calling you to be a forerunner so you can pull them out. So you have to violate the family code. You gotta break it. We are bloodline breakers. I know it's a cute line to say, but it's imperative that you violate the family code because if you get stuck, who's gonna be the one to bring all of you out? Somebody has to be obedient. Somebody has to say, yes, you may go through some things. Joseph like, was a representation of Jesus. He was, he was bruised. He was beaten. He was bound. He was hatred. But he was lifted up so all of us can be drawn to him. He's our, self, our Savior. He's our Redeemer, right? Can you imagine if somebody said, no, don't beat Jesus like that. Don't kill him. I need you to stay over here with me. And then he said, get behind me. Get, get behind me, Satan. Because I have a work to do. I have a work to do. And Joseph, he 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 did not fight with them. It says in verse 21, but when Reuben heard it, Reuben was the oldest, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to him, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit. Now, which is crazy. Don't kill him, but throw him in the pit anyway. And here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So jo when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore. Everybody knows the story about the, the robe of the many colors. Jacob knew he didn't love his, you know, more one son more than the other, but he knew that there was something on his life. So it boggles my mind to think if you even knew this, why you didn't say, son, go for it. Go for it. Give it all you got. We are supposed to do greater than the Father anyway. My parents, my children better do more than me. They have to do it. It's their inheritance to do farther, greater, better, more than I could ever even imagine. That's another teaching for another day. So when jo Joseph came to his brother, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Verse 25. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, bomb, myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. You know, Joseph was the repairer of the breach in his family. He was the bridge for them to have sustained life. They didn't even know it, and I don't believe at this moment that Joseph knew exactly what he was called to do, but he knew because the Lord had given him the vision and the dream that there will be more. I will do more. And so oftentimes we get uh, caught up in our own, like I said, demonic issues, uh, childhood traumas, experiences, and we say, well, I may not be worthy enough. And I'm here to encourage you to say that it's not about worth. It's about instruction and obedience. Because if we're here, God is saying we're worthy enough. Yes, Lord. If we're still alive, that means there's work to be done. And there's a necessary work because we have to advance the kingdom of God. We also have to give back. The Lord tells us to put these things on your heart so your children and the other generations know that I am God. Know that I am with you. And when you have to pull yourself out of familiarity, it, it seems uncomfortable. It's hurtful. It, it's tough. Breaking the family code. But this is what we've done, people of God. We go back and forth. Oh, I'm going to go have family dinner with them. And then you get here, and you feel out of place. And they do whatever they do. I remember when I <laughs> I remember when I first got my tongue, and I went home for a, for a weekend. And I came back, and I was like, my God, these folks is crazy. They all have changed. And then the, the, this, this, this man of God at the time came to me and said, no, you have changed. I said, ooh, for two reasons. Ooh, really? And then, ooh, I was once like that. Wow. <laughs> I may not have been all like that, but I was once in that for me not to notice that I have been changed. Joseph knew he wasn't a shepherd. He knew he was a governor. I know I'm not 
not just a dreamer. I'm a prophet of the Lord. I'm not just this. Put some respect on my name. <laughs> you know why you gotta put some respect on my name? Because God did. That's right. I'm not puffing up myself. I'm walking in the confidence of God. Yes. Joseph had to do that. Not one time did Joseph go back and forth with God, even saying, Lord, what? Why are you telling why are you telling me these dreams? <laughs> Why are you giving me this assignment? You couldn't have picked anybody else. He's like, no, we good. You're going to go on behalf of us. Oh, Jesus. I just want us to get to a place that we are not so caught up in the opinions of man. That we are not easily accessible to break the family code. To violate it. To tear it apart. And do it unapologetically. Because who else is going to go? Then the Bible says, who's going to go for us? Who's going to, who's going to go for us? They're waiting on us to go. They're waiting on us to be bold. They're waiting on us. And we sit here, what's wrong with these churches? I say it all the time, but I'm working. We got to work. It may be uncomfortable. But I'm like, no, that is, we are supposed to righteously judge, right? That ain't right. That's not of God. That's not in the word. And sometimes my husband has to say, honey, be quiet. I got this for you. Because I'll be like, no, listen. Mm -mm. No, we had a conversation. I know y'all heard this before. With an old pastor in Mississippi, Texas, one of these things. And he was going back and forth with me. And every time I would talk, he would lean back like this. And I'm like, that's not in the word of God. That's not in the word of God. No, this is what God said. This is the context. This is Paul did. Listen, I, you know, don't. Don't, don't go back and forth with a woman who knows the word of God in context, in culture, in time. I was like, no, Paul was giving them instructions based on the culture of the time. The 14 and 15 and 16 year old women weren't even allowed to speak in public. So when they told them to come to church, they had to follow the rules that was already there. So every time I was talking, he was like this. But when Apostle Ray talked, he was like, and he said the same thing I said. <laughs> That's already like, I got this. We have to understand. We have to be bold. We have to be bold. We have to be bold because you know why? There are people for every, this morning up with microphones in their hand telling you what seems to be the way of the Lord. Seems to be the way of the Lord. We are, we are caught up in what's good, and what was God and what's evil. But sometimes it's good. But it's still sin. And that's how the enemy will lure you to something that's good and take you away from what is God. Because all this foolishness I've been seeing in this area, I'm like, Lord, why are they eyes not open? Why? Because once their eyes is open, we got to be equipped to help them out of the foolishness. We got to help. To say you've been a blessing. I've been there. We talked about it this morning. Moses was in the enemy's camp. That's why he can tell you your mind, your body. These are the what we, I was doing in the palace. So when he went to the children of Israel, he can help them get out of what they used to be in. This all ties in to violating the family code because Moses had to violate the family code he grew up in. He wasn't even a part of it by blood. He was a part of it by circumstance. My God. I was a, we were a part of a ministry with a dealing with witchcraft by circumstance. You know why? Because all things work together for our good. Because when we got here, the Lord said, I'm sending people to the safe haven. I'm sending the people yes, to Goshen. God. I'm sending the prophets to Goshen. I'm sending the people there. But you have to listen. You got to take heed. Because what happened when the children of God went up against Moses? Mm. Out of there. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Out of there. So back to Joseph. Not one time did he subject himself to their foolishness. Not one time did he he say, "Well, let me let me just go to the movies with y'all." You can, can I come hang out with y'all? And sometimes because the enemy wants us to feel isolated and alone. You need to spend that time with God, strengthening yourself. And like I tell my children, we can have fun, godly fun, right? But you don't have to, to put yourself.
around familiar things to make you feel a part of. Not one time did he stop focusing or pressing through to go back. That's what we do. I'll just go back for a weekend. You know why? You don't go back for a weekend for you. You go back for a weekend because you think it's going to stop him from talking about you. You think, you think going back is going to say, I know we're going to bow down to you. They'll never do it. They'll never do it until it is time. And that is our prayer. That the fight that we fought to get out of these family issues, that one day they'll open up their eyes and they'll have repentant hearts and they'll say, help me. Show me. How did you get through it? That's our prayer. That's our prayer. But you can't go and intermingle. Not one time did Joseph go back to try to win their approval. He didn't go back to them and say, Rule, but you know what? You're my older brother. Can we have can we can we rest taste for a little bit? What do you think about this dream? That's our problem. We want to feel like we're a part of something. We want to feel that hole of rejection, abandonment. And we say, can you what 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 do you think God is saying? Did God give Joseph the interpretation? Did y'all read that? Did he say, come and come? Go and ask your brothers what they think of it. Nope. <laughs> no. How many know the plans of God on their lives? How many know that you are a Joseph? You have to, first generation believer in your family. You are a forerunner. She's a forerunner. Can you imagine if she decides to quit? She's a forerunner. That one, look at her. This beautiful powerhouse is a forerunner for her family. That's why we have to have a community of believers around us to say, girl, you got it. In your own way. You don't get up here acting like nobody else. You are powerhouse how God has intended you to be yourself, your tone, your mannerisms, your personality. It's everything you need. God has given you to pull them out. And if it's not your family, you still got thousands attached to you. So we might, I didn't violate the family code just for my family, for yours. For yours. For yours. For yours. And can you imagine one can chase a thousand, but two can put 10,000 to a flight? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? But what Joseph did do is keep the dream in his forefront. He didn't know what it meant. He didn't know he would be the governor of all of Egypt. But he kept God on his mind. He kept, he held fast to the promises of God. And then we get to chapter 39. Now between 37 and 39, Joseph was sold into slavery the Egyptians, God, and, we, and prophets of the Lord like to say this, they were prophetic ushers. They were prophetic ushers ushering him into a place. Because to be honest, let's just be honest for a second. Let's be human for just a second. Because if God said, listen, Shanka, I'm going to make everybody reject you. They're going to throw you in a pit. They're going to try to kill you. Put your coat in some blood and say, she dead. I'm like, listen, God, you, 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 I'm good. That's what other writers saying. I'm good. I'm good. Because we, we don't want to deal with the afflictions. We don't, that's why we succumb to going back. That's why we have to be healed and whole. So you, you're not lured by the emptiness of the demonic system that are attached to you. That's why they have to be dead. I, I, I was rejected, yes. Have I been delivered from rejection? Yes, but that doesn't sway me. I could be sitting on the couch quiet. By myself, I don't have to interact with y'all. Right? right? Because my mind has to be focused on the purpose of God and not of man. Because, man, listen, man will get you in trouble. And man doesn't have a destination for me to spend eternity in. It'll get me to one. <laughs> but it can't put me in the other. So we get to 39. 
and Joseph is 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 in in the land of Egypt, and and he he is brought there. And Potiphar, and he's an officer of Pharaoh. This is Potiphar's wife. The captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him from the Ishmaelites, right? And 39 and 2 says, The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian masters. Now, throughout this time, Joseph is not going back and forth talking about, you know, my brothers, they, they threw me in the pit. You know, my you know, my daddy didn't even believe my dreams. You know, and he no, he went on to do what he had God had purpose for him to do. He didn't even really know and understand the plans. He was just moving in God. Moving in God. And so when you move in God, the enemy is always there to steal, kill, and to destroy. However, you have to understand, even when those moments work together for your good. Amen. Because Potiphar's wife was like, mm -mm, come on, come on. The enemy was trying to set him up with false accusations. Don't our family and friends do that? Don't they do that? But then we get sucked into the drama. Okay, I'm on the phone. I got a conference call. I'm calling, girl, did you hear what she said about me? Yeah, no, no, no. We don't need to do all that in the season. Because there was false accusations that went against Joseph. And Joseph not once said, listen, woman, I am a woman. Of, I am a man of God. I have integrity. I have, you don't need to be doing this. He, he, he left. He left. And you have to understand that on this journey, the enemy wants you to not mess with his kingdom. So he'll try to get you to stop along the way. That's why steadfast, immovable. Always abounding in I'm, I'm, I'm always abounding in the word of the Lord. Always, a, mm -mm, I gotta keep that dream at the forefront of my mind. I have to keep that I have my purpose only in God, my identity only in God. In whatever situation I find myself in, I have to focus on God. And even when the accusations came and he was thrown in prison, now we're in chapter forty. Joseph is in prison, and I can only imagine because we're human, right? Him saying, "Okay, look, well, how I end up here." You know, I didn't even do anything. You know, how did I end up here? But this is even the, the part that it, it gets really good to me. You know why? Because you can see him getting closer and closer and closer to the purpose God has, has, has allowed him to go over that journey for. Again, let me take note, make note of the matter. He didn't go back to his family. He didn't even say, let me send somebody to Canaan and tell y'all, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm in Pharaoh's house. Because that's what we do. That's what we do. We want to we want to feel accepted when we're doing the work of the Lord. But sometimes it's a lonely place to be because there's such great works that comes out of it that we cannot be distracted by the mundane. We can't be distracted by the things that doesn't matter. Amen. Joseph is in prison. And I love this in, in, in chapter 40 because it says that God was with Joseph, even in prison. And that's why the Bible teaches us to be in season, in, 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 in season and out of season. And everybody thinks that because we have a microphone that this is the end all. No, 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 no. I just been given responsibility. So we all have work to do. And so whether you are up here, whether you're leading thousands or leading one, you have a responsibility to be in season. If you're going to the grocery store, this happens to us all the time. We were there a couple weeks ago. Lady was like this. I was like, the Lord told me to pray for you. She was like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. Right? And so I, I didn't say, wait a minute, let me go get my gold microphone. Let me get the worship team together. No! We have to be ready so even in prison and you have the cupbearer and the baker and they had these dreams, right? And Joseph was like, wait a minute, let me, let me talk to God because this is what I do, right? <laughs> let me give it to you plain so you can understand it. That's why you have to have confidence in God. That's why you have to study to show yourself approved but work in what? You have, come on, Apostle Randy, finish the scripture. <laughs> Rightly dividing the word of truth. Oh, can you imagine for a second if 
Joseph gave his own interpretation of the dream. Mm. Me, say it again, mess everything up. Everything. <laughs> That's why we have to understand the importance, right? Not our own experiences. As a counselor, I'm always saying I'm objective, right? I can hear two sides of the story and objectively and right and, and righteously judge the matter. I'm not going to bring my own experiences in and I'm not going to do this. I'm going to hear what God is saying to me to say to you. That's how we have to be. That's why the enemy wants us to stay broken. Because you can't rightfully judge, you can't rightfully interpret, you can't rightfully give wisdom and counsel if you're not whole. My God, it's I am. I, 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 you know, when the Lord has given me stuff, he gives me such fresh rhema. And I'll go, oh, Lord, this is too much. I got to type this out. I got to type this out. But, but being lied on is never comfortable. I would, nah, I ain't gonna say that. <laughs> I was lied on by the person who lied on me. Can you imagine how that feels? And I'm thinking to myself, you know, in our country, we can say, I can, I can bust you all the way up with just the truth. <laughs> but you have to be quiet. Because being lied on got him into a position where he was in prison, but God was still with him. And then he was so pure and righteous that his gifts still flowed through him. Amen. That's the importance. If you go through all this hell to violate the family code, don't get into a place where you're sinning or running your mouth or causing calamity to come on your life. Because then you're pouring out of a polluted vessel. Joseph remained honorable before the Lord. He had a heartache. He had a setback. He had a, uh, I don't know what's going on here, but when God called his number, who in here can interpret dreams? That's right. If, if God ain't speaking, I ain't talking. But this is what thus said the Lord. Come on. And then just the human side of him said, when you leave, don't forget about me. Jesus, come on. We can be human. We're not superheroes. Superheroes always got a villain after them. Superheroes always have something. Kryptonite is always around when certain men trying to do something. Right? We're not superheroes. We gotta stop telling us that. Because superheroes are superheroes. You right? He was human. He said, please, 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 please remember me when you leave. Joseph sat there for two years. I didn't read in, in chapters 41 where he said he sent letters out of prison to the cupbearer. Can you remember me? <laughs> to the baker. I'm going to send a pigeon note. Can you, listen, I'm sitting in here. You got to be in here waiting. Did, 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 did you tell anybody up there what I can do? That's what we've been, that's what we, social media has taught us to do. You have your name, you got your handle. I'm the voice of the region. I, I am the interpreter of dreams. I, I, I'm the apostle of the apostles. Why are you thinking more of yourself than me anyway? But I'm, I'm saying that this is that 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 this is what God wants us to do. He wants us to detach from the emotions of humanity towards things that will keep us away from doing His will. As prophets, I teach. We cannot be emotionally connected to a word of God. You speak and you move on. Because if you become emotionally attached to that, then you think you're God now, and you're going to help them fulfill it. You've taken God's place. So it may seem, oh, she's real cold. No, listen, I, uh, I will release the word of the Lord and move on. We got to keep it moving. That's for those who are prophetic and those who are prophets. I don't have time to call on you because it's not my words. That's right. Say it. It's not my words. I am a conduit. I am a vessel. So Joseph didn't spend his time sending them letters and notes saying, remember me. The Bible said God was with Joseph. So that means whatever you 
find your situ yourself in a situation that it be righteous and holy, you will have favor with God. The guard said, I, there's something different about this Joseph. There's something different about him. How are you ruling in prison? You're a prisoner. How are you ruling in prison other than God has ushered you into that moment? Because there was a little bit more things to get out of Joseph. Right? That humanity, humanity that came over that said, can you remember me? You can't, we can't do that on the other side. We, 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 can't even, we can't even attach ourselves, not to the humanity, but to the emotions and to the movement of other people. He wanted the, the cupbearer and, 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 the, and the baker to say, you know, Joseph, he can do, you know, get him out too. He really shouldn't even be in there. We want people to speak up for us and defend us. I used to be that way. Because I was, I used to be beat. I used to be talked about. I used to be cussed at every day. And so now you get to a place that you do have a voice. You want somebody to defend you. God is the defender. So in, in, in chapter 41, he, he was there for two years. And then remembered by the cup there. He, and then remembered by the cup there. There are times that we go through our process because God wants to take some things out of us that will in, it interrupt his plans. That will sometimes destroy his plans. Can you imagine if the cupbearer or the baker said, as soon as they got out, you need to get Joseph out right now. But that's out of the will of God. It may felt good to Joseph, but that's not God's plans. And so the uh, Pharaoh had a dream, and the cupbearer said, no, I remember. When I was in prison, there was a man of God there, very integral, very loving, and, and, he, and he interpreted my dreams, and the very thing that he said came to pass. See, the Bible tells us that if a prophet prophesies to you and their words don't come to pass, do not fear them. How many of y'all are putting fear into prophets who have lied? You fear those who speak the word of God and it comes to pass. And the cupbearer said, no, Joseph said exactly what I'm living at, that I will be restored back to my rightful place and that the baker will. Y'all know what happened to the baker. <laughs> so Pharaoh was like, go get him because I've been having some dreams and I need them to be interpreted. And Joseph didn't come and say, I got this. He said, and the Lord said, this is what God has said. He inquired of God. Yes. He inquired of God. I want you to understand, if, if Joseph didn't violate the family code and them wanting him to be a shepherd, he wouldn't be in position to become governor. And so many of us think so low of ourselves <coughs> that we don't even think we can be governor. God wants you to be the CEO of companies. Not for your own glory, but for his. And it's a foster environment where his people are being equipped daily. And then some of these Christian organizations who say that Christian organizations are, have all kind of foolishness in it, we have to come up. We have to come up as there's too many Christian organizations <laughs> to name in this area that have gotten caught up in the ways of the world. We are the standard. We are the standard. And when we come in the authority that God has given us, when we come with the instructions, then everything comes into alignment. Pharaoh is over Egypt. They don't even like shepherds. They think they are detestable. Knowing his family background, but he had the answers of God. And he said, this is what your dream is saying. You have seven years of this. You have seven years of this. And then he says, so what are we supposed to do? That's why we have to be ready. Yeah. That's why we have to be pure and holy and pleasing and acceptable. Because I can't say, now listen, this is what I would do. When we was poor and had no food, I was eating ramen noodles. And we just going to eat ramen noodles for 14 years. No. No. You have to be so in tune with, okay, God, what are you telling me to tell them? What are you telling me to do? That's why the prophet's got to be healthy. 
Because you're preparing the way. Right? That's, listen, I got a whole nother, nother teaching. But there was no way that Joseph could be promoted if he would have stayed in the family. If he would have stayed in the family code. There was no way he would have been able to. So we get to, to, to chapter 42. Oh God, let me, let me say, let me read this. So in, in, in 41, and I was reading 41 and the revelation that God gave me in chapter 41, he said there was no way Joseph could have been promoted within a family that didn't know or believe God's plans for his life. Let me say it one more time here. Yeah, that got me. He said there was no way that Joseph could have been promoted within a family. Hear this in the spirit. A family that didn't believe, know, or believe God's plans for his life. How can you encourage me to be the prophet God has called me to believe when you're in a church that doesn't even honor me on? That doesn't even teach about the giftings of God for the purpose of the kingdom. Why do we go back there? Why do we insist on being in the company of people who don't support God's plans? Why do we insist on modeling our lives, our marriages, after things that have proven not to be good? You have to be strong. You have to be bold. You have to use wisdom when you're in a position to violate the family code. It is for your good. And so a lot of our fighting, a lot of our warfare is when my daddy was like this. My mama was like this. And so that is it's good enough for me. But God is saying, no, 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 it's not. I tell y'all this all the time as I was growing up as a little girl. My natural father is a pastor and he is still the pastor. And they would say, you will marry a pastor? You're going to marry a pastor? And I used to say, but what about me? It's not my end to be the wife of a pastor. What is God calling me to do? Can you imagine if somebody said, baby, God has called you to be a prophet for the nation. At seven years old, you're not going to do things like your family did because you are the one that's going to pull them out. And if they decide not to be pulled out, there's thousands behind you that's waiting on your testimony. Can you imagine the encouragement? That's what I want to give you today. That you have to violate the family code. You have to do what you must. It's imperative. You have to be the bloodline breaker. And you have to stop sending yourself back into those company of people who don't want to see God as you see him. My God. Who don't understand God's plans for your life. You pray too much. You prophesy too much. Y'all be extra over there. And it's all for the glory of God. Because whether you see it today or not, it's for your life too. Joel's, Jonah, excuse me, Jonah was thrown in the belly of a whale. You know why? Ask me why. Because he was mad at God for saving a people that he didn't feel necessary to be saved. And God said, no, you're going to go there and preach to them anyway. He was like, nope, I ain't doing that. God said, watch what I do. We got to do it. He doesn't want anybody to perish. That's why you have a deeper and more sensitive level of discernment. That's why things irritate you. That's why things aggravate you. That's not always your flesh and your attitude and your personality. The Lord is saying there's something there. There's something there. You need to help them violate it. Woo, Jesus! 
You need to help them break forth. You need to help them pull through because there's work to do. And when Joseph's brothers, when the famine came, this is this is the best part. This is who I was trying to get to. When the famine came in Joseph, and Joseph was the governor because Pharaoh was like, you, you, I, I believe God is with you, and they didn't even believe in his God. God is with you. So whatever that what tells you to do, that we will do. And here we go again. Joseph didn't come up with these things on his own accord because it would have been Joseph to have to keep them. The plans of the Lord was the plans of the Lord. And so he implemented them. He said, we're going to have seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, so we're going to, we're going to store up. So when we're in the season of famine, which we are in, people, listen to the prophets when they say, get your beans and get your perishable items. This is not to be paranoid, but the Lord is preparing us. We may not even need it, but there'll be people that will. There will be people that will, and we will be the Josephs rationing our food so when the seven years of famine come, they're eating good. And so when famine got so bad and came and the brothers went, they went because they knew there was food in Egypt. And they got there. They got there and they went before the governor. But this is the thing. Oh, this is what gets me. And in chapter 42, verse 8, it says, And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. <laughs> he was changed. We want them to recognize us. They can't. They're not supposed to. A prophet is without honor in his own home. He's not supposed to see you. The Lord hid him for just a time. And in verse 23 of 42, it says they did not know that Joseph understood them. They did not know that Joseph understood them. For there was an interpreter between them. Come on, catch it in the spirit. There was an interpreter between them. Because we waste our time trying to translate for other people. The interpreter is here. Either they're going to listen to what he says or not. But I'm not. Listen, as, as when I was an investigator, we paid for interpreters and translators. Let me get on the phone. I, I don't know Spanish. I, I don't know. I don't know a Creole. I don't know French. So I would pay for a translator to say, "Can you translate what I'm saying to them?" You got a paid translator right here. He doesn't want to waste your time. He doesn't want you to waste your time. He doesn't want to waste your time. Come on, flow with me. He doesn't want you to waste your time on trying to interpret things that are not even of your business. What he wanted Joseph to do was ration out the food. What he needed the brothers to do was go and get it. You know why? Because when the Lord is setting you up, and this is for his brothers, they went and if you read in Genesis, they went and did all kind of crazy things. They did some detestable sins because that's, that's the life they started. Can you imagine beginning to kill your brother and thinking your life going to end happy? There was no repentance. There was no let me find Joseph and ask for forgiveness, right? Come on. Because we're supposed to go to the Father, then we're supposed to get it right with our brothers. So the Bible says lay down your gifts and go to the Lord, right? So none of that happened. So they walked into areas of their lives that weren't good. And so when you're getting to a place where the Lord is feeding you out of the palm of his hand, sometimes you're tested. You're tested to see, am I really listening to God? Am I really going to be obedient? Am I really going to do what he said? Or this is the way I'm just going to try to get fed. Mm -hmm. And so the brothers came and Joseph 
Joshua was overcome because he seen his brothers. He didn't know if his father was still alive. He didn't even know that he had a, a, a little brother. But he kept his composure in front of them and he went into the back and wept. You know why he wept? I, I believe he wept out of relief of that they're still alive and that I went before them to preserve their life. Reconciliation looks like access to me. 
It does not. Especially if it interrupts the flow of God in my life. Especially when it costs me my peace and my assignment. That's not a price I'm willing to pay. Like it, love it, hate it. You do you over there. I am going to walk with God. Because as soon as the brothers Joseph went before Pharaoh and said, listen, my family's here. My family's here. My family's here. Oh, my family's here, right? My family is here. And it doesn't have to be blood. Bullshit, It can be your brothers and sisters in Christ. It can be your spiritual family. It can be your neighborhood. It can be your co-workers. It can be your friends at school. My family is here. And guess what? I have the answers, the solutions for what they need. And then I'm still pouring out wisdom. I said, y'all, when y'all get here, this is how they do it in Egypt. They can't stand shepherds. So what you do when Pharaoh come and talk to you, or if he talk to you, whoever he tend to talk to, you say, we're shepherds. We tend to the flocks. And Joseph said, I'm telling you that because they think shepherds think. They don't like them. They think they detestable. And what happens is, since they walk in the favor of God at this point, Pharaoh says, well, give them the good thing. Y'all are shouting at that. Send them to Goshen. Send them to the best. Send them to the best. The ones who come. Administrated. 
administrators. That's the blessings of his family line. My God. That was the blessings of his family line. To administer. To preserve life. What are you willing to violate today? What are you willing to violate today? What are you willing to bring up today so you can walk in the goodness of God? So you can walk in your assignment according to his purpose and his destiny. What are you willing to do? This altar is open. If you need help, if you need assistance, if you need clarity, to say, I don't even know what it is I need to, to bring. We have ministers up here who can hear from God. Even if you don't know what to do on a day-to-day -day life. Because that's another thing. We're good at equipping. But the church has been very poor in telling you how to live in the natural. They say, well, you can't go to the movies and you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do this and you can't do that. But they don't say, this is how you do it. If you're going to a movie and it irritates your spirit, get up and leave. I don't care if it came from a father. I don't care if it came from a mother. 
Why do you want these type things? And he and he didn't have the time to argue the words to articulate it, but he knew God had better for him. And little all of he George, he would have been there like the rest of his family. Right? Doing what? <laughs> Having all kind of babies that don't want to do it. And I've been the finest thing that ever walked into the life. Escorting them closer to the Egypt, to the place of promise. My God, they lied on him in Pharaoh's house. 
And God is saying, listen, every time that they, the lies even had purpose. God wants you to be stronger. He wants you to be bolder. And he wants you to be wiser, Joseph. And the last thing I will say to you. That promotion could not come while he was in the system called his family. You cannot be in the midst of jealousy and envy. God literally had to separate him from the faith, come on, that was designed to take him out. Uh, glory be unto God. The reason why he could manage all of the mess is because he was organized. May your apostolic and your grace, my God, many of you, come on, it drives you crazy when things are messy and out of order. That's the power of God. That's the instructions of God in your life. Had he not been an organizer, listen, he, uh, do you know where Joseph first learned how to organize? His family's mess. If you can organize his family, the, the mess of your family, surely you can organize the things of God. And God is saying, many of you have been in a place, and you say, Lord, why does my family fight me so? Why does my family hate me so? Hallelujah. Listen, they first hated me, say it, God. And if you're going to go to the places that God is sending you to, you cannot, listen, be bothered by Glory be unto God. They're going to talk about you whether you're promoted or whether you're poor. You might as well be second in command. Yeah. God was speaking to me real good when my wife was up here teaching and preaching. You got pages of revelation. You've been in a place where you don't understand what God is doing. The light is going to closer. God-given purpose. The favor escorted you and it allowed you to manage it all well. Your natural skills of being an organizer, it's going to work together for your good. And God is saying unto you, listen, it all had purpose. When you begin to come into a place and understand that it all had purpose, you're unbothered by what your family is saying. The most pain that you will ever experience in your life is those that are closest to you. That's why the word of God says a prophet is without honor, even in his own country. It wasn't a stranger that caused you burden. It was your husband. My God, it was a, it was a friend. It was a neighbor. It was your own mother in, in, in many instances.
everything that she has prayed for, she gets to lay eyes on right now. She gets to see the greatness and the anointing that is on your life. As she labored and wrestled in prayer and in fasting, her tears have reached heaven.
the body of believers. We can't say to the arm, I don't need you. We can't say to the leg, I don't need you. We each make up the body of believers. Amen? Amen. So we hold each other up. Listen really quickly. Let's lift up our offering before God. I know we usually do this at another time in service, but we didn't want to disrupt what God was doing, so if you need an envelope, just raise your hand so I want to give one to you. The word says, if a man purposes it in the heart, let them give. If you need an envelope, we have Mr. Marissa standing in the back. Also, we see some new faces in the room, so we want to say thank you. Uh, and welcome you to the place where the love, the faith, and the worship of God is contagious. First time you come, you're a guest, and second time, you're family. But you guys feel like family already. So just fill out one of those cards that they're going to give you. We just want to reach out and connect with you. Share a little bit about who we are and just be a listening ear to who you are and what God is doing in your life. So just fill out that card and you can put it in the offering bucket. Once you fill out your offering envelopes, there's no specific order. You can just drop it there. Ms. Lewis will be standing in a bit of If you want to get on the website, www.contagious.church. We are one church with two locations. We have one in Tampa and one in Charlotte. Just find the Charlotte location and follow the promptings. You can also text to give if you open up your phone. And the message box put give CLT to number 813-308-0638. That is give CLT to 813-308-0638. You can also give on our cash at Money Sign Contagious CLT. Money Sign Contagious CLT. The most important thing is that you give. We want your hearts to be in the right place. As if we have worship through song. You worship through word. Now let us worship through our giving. Show God just how grateful we are. Listen, we can't do this thing called ministry without you. So I want you to be encouraged and know that everything that you sow into this good ground, God is using to produce a great harvest. And I believe it firmly. So we thank you. www.contagious.church. Find a shovel location. Follow the promptings. Text to give, give CLT in your message box to 813 308 0638 and cash app money sign contagious CLT. We have other ways that you can give, but I feel like those are the, the main ones that people use. So, again, we thank you. And once you have given, we just ask that you would just stand. Let us prepare ourselves and dismiss. summer months, I want you to continue to be on the lookout for what we have planned coming up in the fall. We want to be intentional about the assignment that is on our lives. So we're going to go into a time of consecration and really seeking the face of God and see what he has to say regarding this particular ministry. If you feel a leading in like God is calling you to do this, reach out to us and we'll give you instruction. We want everyone to be on one accord. I feel like this is going to be a press, and if we all really press, God is going to do something amazing. I truly believe it. So, Whew. what a service! What a service! What a service! God, thank you for opening your doors once again, God, that we may come in and worship you, Father, for you are true and you have not changed, but I thank you that you meet us here every Sunday, God. You never let your presence depart from us, God, but Lord, we come hungry and ready to receive what you have for us, God, and I believe that your people are going to leave this place changed, transformed, renewed, refined, and restored, God. Because you showed up in a mighty way, God. We got exactly what we needed to continue to persevere and push on and press on toward the mark. The high calling that is set on our lives, God. This faith journey is not always easy, Lord. 
And every Sunday on the Lord's Day, you remind us just how important we are to you. So, Lord, I thank you that you have gone before us and made every crooked path straight. You've made every broad path narrow, God. Thank you for reminding us that you love us, that you'll never forsake us. Now, Lord, as we pray even over this offering, we pray that we will find it honorable in your sight, God. Lord, I pray that you would extend his reach and his influence, God. Let it tap into regions and, and territories and cities and, and nations and states and continents and countries, God. That your word may be disseminated into all the world. But you said to take it from every corner of this world, God. That people may know who you are. So I pray that you would use these seeds and use these gifts, Father God, to create platforms and, and churches, God, and ministries, God, and opportunities for us to evangelize and be of hope to those who are hopeless, be light to those who are darkness, and be love to those who need love. Now, love, we pray. Now unto him who is able to keep us from stumbling and make us stand in the glory of his presence, blameless with great joy. Be glory, honor, dominion, power, majesty, might before time, now and forevermore. In the mighty, the marvelous, and the master's name of Jesus Christ. We all pray and say amen. 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 And amen. Come on, say, I will. I will. Make the love, Make the, love. the faith, amen. and the worship of God amen. contagious. Amen. On the count of three, we are contagious. Make this real big. I want you to blow my eardrum, not really. But I want you to make this big.